it's Lisa Balillo's turn. So would you welcome her as she comes to share the word? Thank you for that worship, worship team. Can we give just, just a, oh man. That was every emotion I think that there was to have from joy to, I don't know, it was amazing. Unnamed emotions. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's an honor and a, and a privilege to be able to minister to you tonight. I think I'm going to have to take my glasses off in order to see my notes, so I might squint at you. All right, well, there you are, okay. So let's just pray. So Father, we know that you're already here, Lord God. You never leave. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this house. Father, we feel the habitation of the Holy Spirit, your glory. Lord, we just say, help us to continue to ascend the hill of the Lord. Lord God, we thank you that our worship pleases you, but Lord, refine it even further. Let us just be poured out ones, Lord, burning ones, and that you would just delight in the worship we have for you. So tonight, Lord, as I deliver this word that you've given to me, I surrender it back to you, Lord God, and I ask you speak through me and let it nourish everyone here or listening online in Jesus' name. Amen. So, even though the title sounds a little scary, I'm hoping to encourage all of us, including myself. I know that pastor said a long time ago, if you ever wanted to really go deep and learn something, teach it. And um, today's title is Tried by Fire. So I'll just start with sort of my sensing, our sensing of what the Lord's been saying, pretty consistent words. And one word that keeps coming up over and over, he wants us to hear this, is Psalm 24, 3 to 5. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? His holy place. It's those who have what? Clean hands, pure hearts. They are the ones that receive blessing from the Lord. And so clean hands and a pure heart, what's that require? That really requires a Holy Spirit-led journey through sanctification and consecration. It's never going to happen without being tried by fire. It is meant to set us apart, and it's meant to make us holy. That's our heart. You could feel it. You could feel the corporate anointing on that. We seek him individually, but when we come together, things happen. And so two Sundays ago, we're worshiping just like we were, and we were singing Refiner. And as we were singing Refiner, the Lord's speaking to me through this song. So I'll hold and not tell you what he told me, but I thought we could just read or sing a stanza. And Pastor, do you have a mic down there? I think we have the words. So we're just going to do a cappello and sing. Can you put? Good. Okay, great. All right. You lead us. If the altar's where you meet us, take me there, take me there. What you need is just an offering. It's right here. My life is here. And I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're the fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire. Purified, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. Right. I want to be tried by fire. Purify. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. All right. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Woohoo. 
Now, isn't that something, that song? We're talking about refining and singing about tried by fire. It's a beautiful melody, and I'm, this is just like we entered. I'm up here on some, two Sundays, and I'm worshiping, and all of a sudden I hear myself say, I want to be tried by fire. What am I singing? I <laughs> so. Literally, I took pictures of the, I'm taking pictures of the lyrics. I'm like, Lord. And then I heard your, your voice in my head, Pastor. Pastor always says, you know, we're not just singing words here. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So, yeah, turn up the heat. So I'm like, Lord, what am I really singing here? So I looked it up. So what does tried by fire mean? Ready? Ready. It means a painful ordeal which tests our strength, our endurance, our resolve, our fortitude while under pressure. Another definition or is when you're in a battle. They use that definition for soldiers. We are soldiers in the Lord. What it tests is your mental and emotional strength or toughness, sometimes physical too. It's testing your courage in the middle of adversity, our trustworthiness, our level of commitment, and even our faith. So whether testing comes, it comes in lots of ways. It could be an attack. It could be the enemy. We are in a spiritual war. It could be assault. But what do we learn in that assault? We learn how to contend. We learn how to fight. We learn how to walk in our authority. Maybe the testing comes differently. An allure into the wilderness, just like Jesus had to go. Who was he led by? Holy Spirit. So what, did, what do we need to learn then? Trust, how to abide, total surrender, brokenness, broken and contrite heart. And obedience. Or maybe the testing just comes from this internal, as Trish would say, agita, right? What is that? That internal ache and anguish, and maybe it's a generational thing, and it's something that we have to work out. We, we need to seek healing, deliverance. We need to learn to be vulnerable, teachable, moldable. It doesn't matter really whether it comes from any of those places, one thing is true. Tell me if I'm wrong. We're all going to be tried by fire. And we're all going to have to face adversity. It's a giant. But guess what? Who killed the giant? Okay? And we are giant slayers. And so I'm here in this, doesn't sound such a fun title, tried by fire, but to encourage us in the Lord and to get excited when we go through adversity and not to have it take us out. That's the hope. Okay, let's see how we do at the end. So Romans 5, let's go there, Reyes. Romans 5, what does it say? We boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. You could say it with me. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little story about this verse. One day, I, was, I woke up, still in the bed, talking to God is what I usually do. But I just opened my eyes this morning, and I literally heard. Suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. Well, okay, this is the Holy Spirit talking to me. And then, all of a sudden, I saw it. I'm a seer. I saw it as a formula. I wish I could have done a slide, but visualize with me. I saw suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and hope over here. I saw the four words. Then I saw perseverance and character, the two words in the middle, kind of fade out like they're in grayscale. You with me on the picture? And I'm laying there talking to the Holy Spirit, having this encounter. I don't know what's going on. But all of a sudden, what's left? Suffering, 
hope. Suffering, hope. And then I heard the Holy Spirit tell me, no, you're missing a word. Suffering produces hope. Suffering produces hope? What? It was like, I want to be try. It was the same feeling. Like, what is this? I had no idea what God was trying to tell me. Did you, anybody ever hear this? I, I, suffering produces hope? It seems incongruent to me. Even though I know this scripture, I say this scripture, I never saw it like this. It was a paradigm shift. I really honestly was like a dog when they go, hmm? Like that. <laughs> okay? So, so I heard the Holy Spirit also say to me, what you think about suffering and what you think about hope impacts how you react and identify with both of them. I said, okay. Then I honestly, I said, well, I don't know what I think about suffering and hope as it's connected. And tongue in cheek, I said, well, I hate suffering and I hope it goes away. Okay? If I were honest. And we have to be honest, but seriously, though. On, on a serious note, he's talking to me. I'm not quite getting what he's trying to tell me, but I know that I know he's trying to tell me something. So I get out of bed. And I'm walking down the hall. And I was going to bring it tonight, but I'll, give you a vi I'll describe the visual. I walk down the hall, and I'm looking at my vision board that I've had for two or three years, Carolyn. I don't know. It, I've had it for a while. I changed certain things on the vision board, but I've had the same vision board, let's say two years to be conservative. Two years every day I look at this vision board. But as I'm walking down the hallway that morning and I'm looking at the vision board, after I have this encounter with the Lord, suffering, hope, Suffering, hope. Okay. I see at the bottom of my vision board, pioneer of hope. I'm like, I, I looked at it like it was the first time I ever saw it. And it's been on the board for two years. I just cut it out. You know, we get together. We have fun. We're like, oh, that's nice. And so I cut it out. I like that. Pioneer of hope. I really had no idea that two years later... Now he's connecting the dot. I said, okay, Lord, I know you're talking to me about hope. And I know I've been suffering, and it, you're trying to tell me it's going to produce hope. I said, okay. So for those of you who really don't know my story, I'm not really here to get into my whole testimony. But I have to just give a little, if you will, cliff, cliff notes, just so you have a little background. So... Um, two years ago, during COVID, I sold my home. One change. Both of my cats, who are like my fur babies, had really bad cancer. I had to nurse them. They both passed and never came with me to my next move. So now I'm in this little cottage, very upset about that, but did the move because I heard the Lord say, now. So I obeyed and I moved, even though my world was upside down. Then I got COVID. My first time, I think I got it only once, but I, I thought I had it twice. But the first time I got COVID was when it wasn't such a bad strain. So I got it. It was really nothing until the day that it was something. And so the day it was something, I'm in this shower, I'm, I'm take, you know, getting ready. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I'm trying to breathe, and the more I'm trying to breathe, the more I can't breathe. So I start to freak out, and so now I can't breathe even more. I didn't know what to do. I live alone. So that day, I semi-passed out in the bathroom because I knew I went down. Boom! On the tile floor. Hit my head, shoulder, twisted my back, hip, hurt my hip, my knee. My whole body was like excruciating pain, but... I didn't notice that pain until I could breathe again. I still can't breathe. And so I try to get up, and I make it to the bedroom, still gasping and trying to breathe, and I fell again. All I know is I said, Jesus! And my breath came back. I didn't talk about it quite 
this way. I am not exaggerating about it because I didn't even want to speak about it. It was the scariest thing that I've ever experienced. So I'm grateful I'm here. So let's, I'll start there. And then the story is what happened just quickly is 15 months, 16 months later, it's, I'm in really good shape from where I was, but the excruciating pain, chronic pain for 15, 16 months has been really a, not an easy road. I've been to every single doctor known to man. I won't name them all, but, every, but the good news is all my tests are great. This is good, but I'm excruciating pain. 13 cortisone shots later, Still excruciating pain. And there's no medical definitive diagnosis. Little by little, I'm getting better. And I believe it's a miracle because it was prayer, the Holy Spirit, and his power because the doctors don't know what is going on. On paper, I look totally healthy. The Lord told me there a couple years ago, your back is healed. My MRIs proved it. There's no structural damage to my my spine. So what's going on? I don't know, but all I know is it was a hard road. Progress, yes, I'm not where I need to be, but one thing I know for sure, God was in the storm the whole time, and he was, he, he's still in the storm with me. But I was tested, so I'll go back to my formula, and all of a sudden I got a revelation about why did perseverance and character grayscale on me in that vision, and hope was blaring. And what I got from what the Holy Spirit was trying to tell me was that because of this journey that I have been on, and some of you who are close to me know the details of it, that perseverance was a test, and not that you're ever perfect at it, but I learned perseverance. And because of that perseverance, it tested the character and standing for God and standing some more and just standing and reading the word and praying and worshiping even when it was hard to stand and I could hardly sit. And so character, it's working on that. I said, okay, Lord, I think I got the picture. We're on a journey and you're doing something in me for a greater purpose and First test, perseverance. Second test, character. Now we're on hope. And I can tell you, for all this time, most of the time, I was in survival mode. Pure survival mode. I get up. It was like counting the hours to go to bed. I don't know why, because the bed wasn't comfortable. The seat wasn't comfortable. Standing wasn't comfortable. There was no comfort anywhere. I couldn't find comfort anywhere. So... But I did know this. When he showed me that, I said, okay. And I'm just fast forwarding after everything I'm going to share with you today. God has reignited my hope. So, hallelujah. I, with an assurance that I didn't have before I went through this. So, like many of you, if not most of you, and our stories are different, but we all face adversity. I have faced many trials of different kinds, but I've grown through the suffering just like I know you are too. And I've grown in ways that my comfort zones could never deliver. And I say zones because I've got a lot of zones. You know, like air conditioned zones? I don't have one. I've got a lot of zones. <laughs> and the criticalness of learning in the midst of him breaking these things is important. Now, I've learned a lot. I can't share everything, but one thing I'm going to get, which is a root. He shared with me, and I am trying to walk out every day, is do not despise the wilderness where suffering abounds. Because Jesus was called there, and so are we. That was at the root of my learning. So being tried by fire is this really profound work of the master potter. That's not fun, but we know that his single desire is to Jeremiah 29 us, is to prosper us, not to harm us, to give us hope and a future. And this kind of hope, as I studied hope to get ready for tonight, and as he's been talking to me, because this revelation came about a month and a half ago, is it points to his glory, this hope. 
Romans says, and this is not an exact quote, but it's, we boast in our hope of sharing in God's glory, which is produced through suffering. That word suffering, it could be a trial, a test, adversity, affliction, trouble, misery. It could be a number of things. Those are, those are the definition of suffering. And this kind of hope, though, that we're seeking, this hope, hope, is never going to be achieved by avoiding suffering. It's actually achieved through growing through suffering. In fact, this is a great book I'm going to recommend, Dutch Sheets. It's The Power of Hope. And he gives a quote here. He's actually got a chapter that says, embrace the pain. Okay. And then it says here, this is his quote, God wanted more than to simply remove my pain. He also wanted to use my pain. Yeah. So he's always doing something beyond what we can think or imagine. And so it's the kind of hope that only God can give based on a few things. One is the assurance of his power, of his presence, and the persistent trust in his promises. And it's not just trust. It's a persistent trust. You know, God is the trustworthy one. And Ivan said to me when he was here, Roman, right, is his last name? And he said, I asked a question at the conference for the prophetic conference, and he ended up speaking it to me, but that's neither here nor there. He said something to me. He said, this is a season where God is saying, what do you want? And I'm like, what do I want? And he goes, not what you want for this one or what you want for that one. No, what do you want? I was like, wow, what do I want? He goes, and that's not an easy question. It's not. But one day I was like talking to God and crying, and I basically said, Lord, really what I want is I want to know you, and I want to be trusted by you. Like, trusted. Because he said, you're not his servant, you're his friend. I want to be that. I want, I want to be that friend that sticks closer than a brother. And, and so I said, and yes, Lord, I want all those other things that I desire. I want a husband. I want a family of my own. I want to be 100% healthy again, no pain in my body. Yes, and I want to work for Trump. So <laughs> it's out there. If he's listening. Anyway. God, God asked you what you wanted, God and you asked told him. Me. That's it. Okay. All right. Oh, Lord. Okay, where was I? I don't know. So, so you know, it's what do, what do we want? We want to be the trustworthy ones. That we are his friends, not just servants, but that he tells us his secrets, and he, he helps this word that he's left us come alive so that it makes us come alive. And, and so it says in Hebrews 11, now faith is confidence in what we hope for, which I just went through. And it's the assurance about what we don't see. So a great example, I went right in my head to Abraham and Sarah. They waited 25 years for that promised son of theirs. And that couldn't have been easy. But it says in Romans 4.18, I love this scripture. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. I love that verse. Against all hope. Did you ever feel like that? But Abraham, in hope, believed and then those two, that powerful word, and so. We have an and so coming, all of us. So I probably would say that it's an underestimation or an understatement to say that Abraham and Sarah, as they were waiting, waited perfectly. I would say that's an overstatement. And yet, even though they weren't perfect in the waiting, God was still faithful. All I know is I look to that story and I say, I, that encourages me. Does that encourage you? We don't have to be perfect in the waiting.
because he's with us in the waiting, and he will purge and purify and shape that right out of us anyway. So, so there's a couple of other scriptures that speak of this hope. So in Hebrews, it says, let us hold unwavering. Don't let go of that hope. This hope that we profess before he who has promised is faithful. And then it says in Psalm 130, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And it's in his word that I put my hope. So just like faith without hope, excuse me, faith without works is dead. Faith without hope is ineffectual. We cannot have the adequate faith we need in Christ without hope. So let us not lose heart. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians. It says, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day and day. For this light and momentary affliction, even though it feels like forever, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. I'll, st I'll stop there, and let's jump to Romans 8, Reyes. There it says, hope is that which is seen is no hope at all. If I'm hoping in what I see already, it actually says here, who hopes for what they already have, Right? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently or impatiently like Abraham and Sarah. It doesn't matter because the point is he's faithful. Okay. So the message is suffering produces hope is don't lose heart. It literally is defined as don't lose hope. And the heart is critical. This is the wellspring of life. It's our strength. And the word says, above all else, what are we supposed to do? Guard it. Because if we give up, it's defined in Greek, eklu, E-K-E-L-U-O. It's defined as having lost our strength. We grow weak. We become faint-hearted. This is what, when we give up, it produces. So... Let's resist, when we're in adversity, try to resist the temptation of allowing frustration, impatience. Anybody ever been impatient? God's time's not our time. Discouragement, disappointment, or pain of any kind, whether it's mental, emotional, or physical. Let's not let those things weaken us. There's spirits attached to that. Now, we all get disappointed, but if we camp out there, the spirit of disappointment will come on us. So rather, what does Hebrew say for us to do? Fix our eyes upon Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. He endured the, tr the cross with the joy set before him. And he despised the shame. Says it differently. Are we on uh, Hebrews 12? just so you could follow along. Okay, thank you. So, is that Hebrew stroke? There we go. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. He's the pioneer of our faith. He endured that cross. He despised the shame. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. And then it says to us, consider him who endured. He endured such opposition. Why? So that you will not grow weary and lose heart. He's our example. What's the example? We know this, but let's be reminded, almost daily be reminded. He was tested in the wilderness. He was suffered dripping blood from his face when he was in Gethsemane. He was scourged and flogged on that pillar to the point of being unrecognizably human. And in that state, he picked up the cross and carried it up the Via Della Rosa. And I remember a year ago saying, Lord, how did you pick up that cross? How did you do that? 
He was in our human form. And that Via Della Rosa, it's defined as the way of sorrow. He was nailed, he bled, he was died on that cross, but worst of all, he was separated for the first time in his entire life from his father because of our sin. That's enduring. He was tried, yet he endured the suffering for one reason, because he had hope. He had hope in the assurance that his father had a promise and he had the power to resurrect him. But not just him, resurrect all of us. That was the joy set before him. So he endured. His momentary affliction actually prepared for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. He is our hope of glory. He is our hope. Suffering produces that kind of hope. Oswell Chambers says this. You know who he is. He wrote my utmost for his highest is a devotional. Thank you, Pastor. He said, God's way is always the way of suffering. The way of the long road home. The flames in our life sanctify us and draw us near to God in ways that nothing else can. The furnace contains treasure that cannot be produced anywhere else. So let's look at Isaiah 48.10. This says, interesting scripture, it says, Indeed, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested and chosen you in the furnace of affliction. Okay. <laughs> That's like, I want to be tried. That's this. This is this. Turn up the heat. <laughs> Turn up the heat. And this is, oh, this is my favorite, okay, is James. I love James, the book. I don't know why it convicts me so much. James says, consider it pure joy, all joy, right? When you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, this was interesting. He talked to me. I never saw this before. He said, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Hmm. Let perseverance finish its work. Suffering produces perseverance, produces character, produces hope. Let it finish the work. Its hope is the finished work. Being tested in the scripture here that we just read is the same kind of testing that they put metal through. And you probably know, scientists in the room, you, you, they heat up this metal, they put it in this blazing fire, they melt it down, then they scoop out all the, the impurities, then they stick it back in the fire and they smash it down and they take out more impurity. They keep doing this over and over and over. So when is the silver or the gold pure? Anybody know? It's when the metallurgist can see his reflection. Okay. Our testing has the similar goal, is that God can see his reflection in us. I have, I'm going to just pause for a second, but I'll go back. But if I were, this is my favorite book. If I were to recommend any book, it'd be this one. It's called Master Potter. Jill Austin, who's with the Lord now, um, was an artist. She was a, um, she did pottery. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And this is an allegory, and I took it on vacation with me, one, and, and it changed my life. So I can't get into the details of it, but just like the metal in the fire and getting purified is a great metaphor, so is this. She takes all these different broken pots, clay pots, and they all have names and they all have personality, and you'll find yourself in almost all of them. 
And she actually takes you through the journey of these clay pots becoming who they were meant to be. And we're, for pottery, what is the pottery meant to be? Well, you have a dish, and you might have a bowl, and a cup, and a saucer, and they all have different purpose, but they're really not fully ready for their ultimate purpose until they're glazed. But she'll take you through the whole process of what it means to get glazed. And there's a breaking on the potter's wheel and I think, you know, clay wanting to crawl off and smashing it and getting knives and sticking it in there and trying to make it something and shaping it and then sticking it in the kiln. And there's a whole journey she does it. I was mesmerized by this book. It will, it will allow this whole notion of being shaped by God. Through adversity, you go on the mountaintop, and you go in the valley, and you go on the mountaintop. I was getting dizzy in this story because they kept going up, and they were down. I'm like, God, oh, they're going down again, and they were up and down. And so ultimately, you get the picture of this is our journey right? We do have highs. We do have lows. God's in it all, and he's always doing something. Always. And so, let's listen, let's listen to this scripture, uh, Psalm 66. I'm not sure which uh, version's up here, but I, yeah, that's the one I picked. So, this is something. It says, for you have tried us, O God. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net, you laid an oppressive burden upon our loins. You made men right over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but here's the best part. Yet you brought us out into the place of abundance. Hallelujah. This is where we're going. Hallelujah. So the journey is tough, but we're going somewhere. So... Chandler Moore, he actually, I think, was the lyrist on um, the song Refiner that Pastor led us in. And he says about that song, he said, I want to be tried by fire song. It's a dangerous and costly prayer. But it's so worth knowing him more intimately. And I couldn't agree more. The fiery trials of chronic and debilitating pain that I've been in, and people have had it way worse. And sometimes I think, Lord, what I've been through, as hard as it is, it's like a splinter to you, right? But it's relative. And, and so enduring that wasn't easy. But I can testify, and I like to testify, that that suffering has deepened my relationship with the Lord in ways that comfort could never have produced. I have faith and hope now that he will finish the good work that he started. We've read that scripture since we've been saved, but it has a whole brand new meaning to me now. He actually gave me a visual, a um, visual, so he talks to me like that a lot, a picture, picture frame. How am I doing on time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor. Picture, picture frame. And in it, all I could see, it took up the whole frame, were very thick vines. They were twisted. There was nothing on them. You could see the holes in the wood. And, like, I could see it. It, it looked dead. And then all of a sudden, I saw a poof, like that. And there were these big, purpley, grape-looking things with, you could see the dew on them. And, and I said, that was, picture was for me that there is a purging and there is a pruning, but it's for a purpose. He's not going to leave us like that. There's going to be more fruit and fruit that will remain. So that's our promise. You know, we're not promised an easy life. There's nothing in the Word that says that. Actually, it's the opposite, if you think about it. James, he actually says, when you face trials. He doesn't say if you face trials. So in 1 Peter, if we can go there, Reyes, it says, okay, well, if we know it's when we face trials, why are we surprised, right, that this, the way I wrote it, was this fiery, painful ordeal when it comes upon us to test us, although some, like something strange happening to us, right? 
But it, it says in this verse, but rejoice, because now you are participating in the sufferings of Christ, so that, I love these two little words, or therefore, I love these little words, because there's something on the other side of it. And this is being overjoyed when his glory is revealed. We all want glory. This is the way to get there. So why are we so surprised? Right? Like, like why are we? Why, why do we get so downcast? Because we're human. We, we do. We know this. We trust his word. We know him. But we do get surprised. And because maybe it, because it's hard, it hurts, maybe it feels like I'm sidelined, or I have a loss, a loss of control, or it's disrupting everything in my life. Because, like, can you dot, 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 fill in the blank? Why am I surprised, Lord, when this happens? Or dismayed? But so if we can get in touch with that and give that back to God and dialogue with him, because no matter what the cost and no matter where the testing's coming from, as I said earlier, it doesn't matter. Because one thing is true. God is always the fourth man in the fire, always. You could take that to the bank. He's always the fourth man in the fire. And he's going to bring us forth as gold and with great abundance. That's what the word says. Amen? All right. So let's grab onto this scripture. It's now my scripture verse. It's been for about a year and a half. Isaiah 40, 31. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. This one line, they will run, I have been decreeing, I am going to I want to run hard for you, Lord. And so I'm not there yet, but I keep decreeing it, and I am going to run hard. So are you. So with this, the Lord says this to me. Okay, I'm not quite where I want to be. I'm getting where I want to be. I have hope for the future now again. But this is what he told me. He said, our assignments and promotions don't just come in the breakthrough, but they come in the breaking. I'll say it again. Our assignments... And promotion. Sometimes we attach it to the breakthrough. When we break through, we'll be promoted. When we break through, that's our assignment. Uh uh. What the Holy Spirit said in your breaking, that is an assignment. And you are promoted right there because you are identifying with the sufferings of Christ. So Bill Johnson says, when God's glory rests on a sanctified life, it establishes it, but his glory on an unsanctified life crushes it. Navigating the hard seasons well builds character, it builds trust, and it prepares us to steward the blessing and the favor of God. Okay? And even this Sunday we remember what Apostle Lewis said. He said, we're all called to be light in the darkness. And when we go into dark places, there's adversity there. There's trials. We're going to be tried. But he said, we're going to be pulverized and broken into many pieces, if you remember. <laughs> so that we can carry the glory and be distributed to all those in need. That's what he said. This is our destiny. So anybody in the fire right now waiting for the glory, take courage. Because Christine DeMarco actually wrote a song about take courage. It's so apropos. I won't sing it. Take courage, my heart. Stay steadfast, my soul. He's in the waiting. He's in the waiting. Hold on to your hope as your triumph unfolds. He's never failing. 
never failing. This is the God we serve. So last point. I'm rounding the corner here. Suffering produces hope. We got that? It also produces hope deferred. Okay. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. So I clicked in and I looked at that word sick. It could make, it means weak, wounded, bruised, grief stricken. It could mean indifferent, apathetic. That sick condition just what the enemy loves. That word deferred means to put off, suspend, delay, postpone. And most of us put a period right there. Put off, suspend, delay, postpone. But there's more to the definition. Until a later time. So, when we're in the fire, it's really important for us to remember that hope deferred is just that. It's deferred. It's not a permanent location. Okay? There is an appointed time. It's his promise. And he's not a man that he should lie. Joseph, let's look at him real quick. 20 years it took from the time he got that prophetic word that his family was going to bow down to him and the time it was fulfilled. 20 years he endured physical, mental, emotional agony. He was rejected. He was betrayed. He was falsely accused, thrown in a pit by his brothers, sold into slavery, and was unjustly imprisoned. Then it says in Psalm 105, that's part of his story, but then it says, until, everybody say until, until the time that his word came true and when the word of the Lord had tested him and refined him. So there is an appointed time for everything. We have to remember that because what the enemy does, he comes in to stir that in patience. Delay is not permanent. It's only temporary. The, un, the yet unanswered word of God purged, purified Joseph, and prepared him to steward that promise. And he did that well. He actually demonstrated an endurance that was inspired by hope. And it says in Psalm 4 that he was enlarged by his distress. Not just him. This is a word, but it, it applies to him. We can be enlarged by our distress. So help us, Lord, remember that there's always a point in time and that our story is not over yet. Jesus chose to endure suffering with confident expectation and hope in the resurrection, and so must we. Let me leave you with two quick short verses, and then I'll pray. This is just to bless us and encourage us. James 1 says, Blessed is the man or woman who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And lastly is a Job. It says here, he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord, how powerful your word is, Lord. We are not here without a roadmap, Father, that you were so gracious, that you gave us not only Holy Spirit, but you gave us our, your word. Lord, it's dynamic. It's alive. It feeds us so well. Lord, we thank you for the revelation that suffering produces hope. And, Father, that you are our hope of glory. I just pray over every person here or in the sound of my voice over the Internet, Lord God, who's listening. Lord, I just decree and declare that this is a season where we will rejoice in our adversity. You will teach us, Lord, how to continue to praise you in the midst of the storm because you are 
in the storm with us. Lord, you know you have identified in ways with us that we can't even comprehend. You know what the struggles are that we face because your struggles were so much greater. So Lord, let us be a good representation of you, Lord, that we would glory in your sufferings and Lord, that we would allow it to create perseverance in us to refine our character that we may walk in hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Carolyn, could you come up for a minute? Don't leave yet. Could you guys stretch your hand towards Lisa? Because uh, I want to just speak a Father's blessing over you because you, uh, you are surviving the trial by fire. And instead of being downcast about it, you're, uh, you're giving testimony in the midst of it. And uh, that's how this is supposed to work. Could you just speak healing over, over Lisa's body? She's been... There's battle fatigue that happens after a while, you know? Like you just become a little numb to the whole thing. And Lord, we just speak a blessing over your daughter right now for just being steadfast and persistent and, and seeing the hope in the midst of the trial that she's been going through. And Lord, we're just, we're just lifting her hands up like we were doing earlier today. Lord, that she's not in this alone, but that she's surrounded by a troop of warriors and intercessors. And just as she intercedes for others, or we're going to be believing with her for a complete, complete open shame of the enemy that tried to take her out, that he is going to regret the day that he messed with your daughter because she is a weapon of mass destruction in your hands. We speak life and health over her body, no pain. And just like Joseph said that what, what his brothers meant for death, through that came much life. And even though they did bow down to him, it wasn't where he ru was ruling over them, but it was because you showed him what was going to happen beforehand. So we say that now, Lord, that Lisa's body is free of pain. We speak it by faith that her body is free of pain 100%. I know there's been improvement, but we're believing for the finished work that you desire for her to have. And I don't know if you have anything. Amen. And so I just also, Lisa, as you opened up, I heard the Lord say that this is for his purposes. And when you said pioneer, the Lord says, I'm giving you strategies to pioneer through suffering and that you will be used as an instrument of hope for many who are going to be struggling through suffering and pain and, and, and just isolation. And the Lord says, daughter, I am so pleased that you even now, even in your weakness, he says, I'm making you strong. And you are standing and you are declaring by, by faith what I'm doing in your life. He says, the work, it will be completed. He said, you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So I just want to do one more thing before I let Lisa go. Aren't you glad she was just honest with us tonight? Isn't that a beautiful thing? You know, it says in Philippians 3 that Paul was, was talking about the old things that he didn't count as important anymore. And he said, the thing that's most important is that I want to be found in him. I want to know him. But also, he said, I know the fellowship of his sufferings. And he was talking about Jesus, right? Here he was, the perfect man who lived in this sinful world. So that alone could be a form of suffering. The fact that we have an old nature that tries to rise up and wants to sin. And we're fighting with that. Even when God changed Jacob's name, it was the one who wrestles with God, right? So there's this, there's this tug of war going on. But I just want you to stand for a minute because there's just a two-minute clip, uh, part of a clip that we posted this morning from Jane Haben that I think is a word for you, but it could be a word for all of us because if we're honest, all of us are suffering with something going on in here. We're all battling, at least battling the temptation to sin. And if you're not, then I want you to pray for me because... There's nobody that's not subject to that one, but I just want you to listen to what she said. She was speaking at her church two weeks ago, but I think we can all take ownership of it based on what we were hearing tonight. So go and ahead, Ray. I want you to lift your hand all over this place because go I ahead, the Spirit do of the Lord saying, my sons and daughters, I want you to be sensitive to the times in the Spirit. I want you to be sensitive to this transition season that you're coming into right now. For the Lord says things have changed whether you see it in the natural 
or not. Take it. Things have shifted Take it. in the spirit whether you can actually see the fruit of that or not. Right. And the Lord says, I am even decreeing to you today that the Pharaoh's armies, the enemies that have pursued you over this last season, the Lord says, I say to you today what I said to Israel then is that those that pursued you to this point, you will never see again. The Lord says that I am laying a plumb line today, says God. I have surely opened up a red sea of deliverance. You may feel like you've been staring at a door of impossibility. You may feel like you've been looking disaster in the face, but the Lord says the door of disaster and the door of divine reversal look exactly alike. The door of the of disaster and the door of the supernatural look exactly alike until it opens. Yeah. And the Lord says, "Get your eyes out of the uh, out of the mud. Get your eyes out of the mully grubs. Get your eyes out of depression." The Lord says, "Start lifting your eyes up. Start raising your expectation up." For the Lord says, "I'm the God that parted the Red Sea then. I'm the God that'll part your Red Sea now." And the Lord says, "The Red Sea is going to take out your enemy." Says the Lord, "It's not just going to deliver you. It's going to take out your enemy." So Sally, go ahead and blow that trumpet and let's give the Lord a Come shout. Come on, give the Lord a shout. A declaration. Hallelujah. That's a good way. Woo! That's good, Ray. Thank you. That's a good word. If you want to want to hear it again, you could just go on our YouTube channel or our Facebook page. That was today's posting. It's 10 minute clip total or whatever. That's just the first two minutes. But let's just receive that word. You know, I don't know if you heard right at the end, it was not just that they were getting delivered, but the enemy was completely wiped out. The whole army of Pharaoh was wiped out. And you might wonder, why was God hardening his heart all along the way? Because that was the thing it took to wipe out. Israel never had to fire a shot. God took the trial of those 10 plagues, but finally they saw what come to pass she was dancing on the other side. The horse and the rider have been thrown into the sea. Amen. So, Lord, we receive that prophetic word. We say it is not just for her church. It was for all of us that have been going through a time, uh, a difficult time. But we're in that transition right now. I love what she said. The door of opposition looks the same as the door of blessing until it opens. So we're looking at that door opening of opportunity to come out of that slavery of, of sin and Egypt and coming into the promised land. Lord, we receive that word by faith and, and, and we walk out of here with a song in our hearts tonight, Lord, with hope in our heart for you. In Jesus' name, amen.